So now I want us to do this up on our feet as we invite our Father, starting with the opinion. Yes. 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 Show your love for Pastor M. Thank you. Wow. I have to say two things. Number one, like none of us knew what he was talking about. <laughs> except one little boy. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know which school. CBC. I think you went to CBC. <laughs> That's a competency-based curriculum. And then number two, it's like only one person in this world is in this room can is qualified to know whether I'm husband material. So <laughs> but, uh, but in Jesus' name, I receive it. I receive it. Wow, was that amazing? Yes. I've had, like, the testimonies of going out are incredible. Like, demons have fled. Like, joy is in the house. By the way, you're different from how you are in the morning. So I went, like, I had to leave when I preached because I was preaching at a church in Siokimao. So I went, preached, and came back. And, and when I walked into the room, it's like a different room. Like, I feel like the joy of the Lord is in this house. And honestly, I really believe it's that joy of fruitfulness and the joy of obedience. That when we obey God, joy comes. You often think that when I disobey or when I do my thing or when I preserve myself, then I'll be joyful. But actually, no. It's when we obey God despite our fear. Anybody who obeyed despite your fear? Yes. And so come on, let's just give glory to God. Lord, we love you, we bless you, we thank you for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I speak over your campuses. Because you've done this today, this is the smallest you'll ever be. People will fill your church. And you'll have a section in heaven with people that are named after you. Simply because of what you've done today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Please have your seats. God is so, so good. By the way, we have... Um, we're just trying to figure out how to get the testimonies because we just know if we start now, we're leaving tomorrow. Yeah. Like, we'll, it'll go into the service at Hill City. So what we've tried to do, we're just trying to think of a creative way to do it. Um, we, we want to ask you to use an email. The, 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 the web guys were trying to create something where we can all write and send videos and send whatever, but it's just hard to put that all together. So we asked them if they can at least set up an email. And the email is up there, the gathering at mavonochurch.org. Please, please, please. I want to charge you, I want to instruct you, please write your testimony and put it there before today is over. As quickly as you, we want to just gather as many. And you know why we want to gather them? Number one, because we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We want to have as many testimonies in this place that tell the world that revival is here. So let's just collect those stories, let's glorify God with them. We also want to be able to, uh, to, uh, to testify, because when people are watching this on video later, they won't be able to understand the experience. But hopefully if our testimonies are gathered, they'll be able to get a sense of what God is doing. And hopefully it will bring them in into what God is doing. Now, some of you I know writing a testimony is hard. It's not, it's not your thing. So I, maybe you can, if you can record it, uh, a video, and then hashtag it, the gathering, uh, we'll be able to get that as well. But if you can use any one of those two, uh, but, but definitely this is preferable. So please, just write it down, the gathering at mavunochurch.org. And as soon as you get an opportunity, just write down, even if it's in brief, hey, we went out, this is what happened. Hey, God has healed me in this way. It could be anything that's happened in the gathering. We just want to collect all the powerful testimonies. Are there some powerful testimonies in the house? And, 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 and if, I mean, I know we might have room for one like crazy or two crazy ones. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I know. But we're going to try and see. So let's see how time goes. So um, I want to make sure we have time to commission you. Remember, we're commissioning you to go out as bivocational pastors and change this world. And, amen? Uh, you have to be the spreaders of the revival. You have to carry the fire. There's a fire in this place. And every one of us has to take that fire wherever we are going. Let me tell you what. What you're seeing happening here has to happen in every Mavuno campus. We cannot go into those places and, find, and leave them the same way. The fire that is in this room has to go into those places. Our homes can't be the same. After those of you who have been experiencing this, you cannot go home and home remains the same. That would be such a letdown. So we have to press in. It means as you go home, it's preaching the gospel, it's healing people. God has given us the equipment to do that, isn't it? We are prayer suppliers. So wherever you're going, uh, we, we have to determine after this, we're not going back. I'm not going back to what it used to be. Anybody who, who knows, I, we can't go back. 
yeah, I can't go back to what used to be. I can't go back to Mavuno Kampala the way it used to be. It's in trouble because of you guys. Mavuno, the guys in Kampala have no clue what's about to happen to them. There's some revival fire coming uh, from this place. It's just going to light that church up. I mean, life we already, you guys are on fire. I mean, it's like, I think the whole church, the whole church is here. The whole church is here. I just think they're going to rock. But even at Hill City tomorrow, I believe that this, the presence of God will be so powerful in this place tomorrow. Like, like the guys who are in this service, you'll even tell that there's something different. And so revival is not a feeling. The feeling is a beautiful thing. But revival is obedience. It's repentance. It's leaning into what God is doing. And as we obey, God will continue to fulfill his work. Amen. Amen. And we're also going to pray for healing. I told you in the morning, we pray. And if it didn't happen, we pray again. And we'll just keep praying until it happens. Amen. So, okay. Let me, guys, are, okay. The rule of the afternoon is what? You stand. If you start feeling some, something happening in your body, some food digestion connecting with your nervous system, causing you to start dozing off, stand up to your feet and go to the back or walk to the side. And there's no offense. Yesterday, quite a few people told me they stood up and that's how they managed to stay in the spirit as we were walking along. So, so make sure you don't miss out uh, because you fell asleep. So I want to just conclude. This is the last teaching I'm going to give uh, before we jump into the commissioning. And um, I've been praying every day. Like, what would I teach? In fact, uh, like my pastors, I, I didn't even have time to discuss with them because it's been so immediate. God, what do you want me to teach today? I really sense that God wants me to teach about the perils of passivity. The perils or the dangers of passivity. The perils of passivity. I really sense that's what God wants us to talk about today. Um, there's a book by that title by a man called Frank Hammond, and um, some of the ideas I got from that, but it's just something God has been sharing and speaking uh, to both my wife and I, the perils of passivity. Let me just say this. We have understood in this church that the enemy only gains access into your life if a door is opened to him. As a believer, he has no right except if the right is given to him. And we remember we went through Simama last year and we discovered that that door could be opened by people in authority. That's why it's so important to understand authority in your life. A father can open the door to the enemy for his family. Uh, that's what happens. It, that, it, that door can be opened. It has to be closed. Uh, national leaders can open a door for, their, for, their, for the people in their country. And that door has to be closed. Um, if, you look, if, you, if you go to places where there's, uh, there's communism, you're going to find that people struggle and somehow there has to be some deliverance because spirits were let loose by national leaders who God had put in charge of the nation and they brought demonic oppression instead. Uh, when there's a father who brings witchcraft into the house, then the bondage can actually affect generations until somebody steps up and says it's finished. Somebody actually steps up and takes charge. Somebody in authority steps up and takes charge. So a door can be opened to the enemy. And common doors include things like family patterns, uh, sin, trauma, Religion, relationships and sex, occult, indiscipline, all those are common doors that can cause bondages to come into a family. But there's one door that many people don't know about. And it's one that we often don't talk about. You'll hardly see people doing spiritual warfare for it. You'll hardly see deliverance sessions for this door. And this door is one of the most common doors that causes many believers never to flourish. Causes the fire to start up in church and then by the time they get home it's finished. And this is one you have to be careful about because every one of us is on fire right now. Come on, somebody. The Holy Spirit is here. And there's something that's already happening to your faith just because you're here. But the one thing you want to do is understand that there's a door that, if you, that you want to be careful never to open because it will stifle, stifle the fire that God is lighting in your life. And this is a door of passivity. Being passive. Just being, being that person who is just passive. Passivity means lack of vigilance. Just a person who's there. You're just, you're just flowing. You go with the flow. First uh, Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says something about that. It says, be well balanced. This is amplified version, which means temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking to say, someone to seize upon and devour. In other words, you must maintain a, pos a posture of aggression towards the enemy. In life, you cannot live in passivity. 
The minute you became a believer, the minute you became filled by the Spirit of God, the minute you started becoming, you became a son of God, you became an enemy of the kingdom of darkness. You're no longer in neutral territory. You're now in the battle. By the way, there's no option because before, if you say that's, wow, oh my goodness, I didn't want to be in war, I should have stayed unsaved. You are still in the war, it's just that you're on the opposite side. And the devil was not really bothered with you because you are in his kingdom. In fact, they say if you haven't met the devil recently, it's because you're walking in the same direction. The devil is not into you once you become a Christian. He's going to oppose you. He's going to find ways to frustrate you. He's going to find ways to stifle the faith in you. He's going to find ways to keep you from praying. So passivity, we have to fight that because we must maintain aggression against the enemy at all times. Synonyms for passivity, they include words like not active. So that's what the word means, not active. Lacking in energy or will. Somebody who's lacking in energy, you don't have the willpower. Complacency, indifference, laziness, don't care, whatever, unresponsive, non-participating, unassertive, stoic. These are just words that are saying the same thing, passive, passive, passive. And it's very, let me just say this, it's very hard to minister deliverance to a passive person. Wow. I, I've tried, there are times I've done that, and it's difficult. Somebody who just, whatever, man. I pray for you, whatever, man. <laughs> let me tell you, that, that is, people don't understand how strong a stronghold passivity is. Wow. It just opens a door for the enemy. When you're passive, it's like Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Mm. There's something you did. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Your faith has made you well. Master, even, even the dogs eat from the food that the children have. Your faith, your daughter is healed. Your faith has made you well. There's some, passi- there's some aggressiveness that causes Jesus to say, your faith has made you well. There's an aggressiveness that faith requires. Active faith is important. It's critical in order for you to receive anything from the Most High. Passivity will kill you. And that's why James chapter 4, verse 7 says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Oh, come on. Sons of God and daughters of God, you have the ability. Let me tell you, this is the most powerful thing in the whole scripture. You need to understand this. May the Lord open your mind to understand this. That the devil is not just anybody. The devil is one of the cherubs that God created. If you read anything about cherubs in the Bible, you know, I used to think cherubs were these angelic little things with big, the Renaissance threw them like that, with big cheeks, and they're so cute little angels with dainty wings. That's a lie. A cherub is described in the book of Ezekiel. A cherub is this angel that has four faces. Like you can't tell what you're looking at. It's an ox, it's a man, it's a lion. It's, it's like, it's just, it's a being. It's a, it, you, you, it's not, you don't, they don't even call it an angel. They just say this being. And it has wings. It has four wings. It's like, it's like wings and then wings. And then all the wings are covered with eyes. It's like, it's, when you think about it, it's scary. It's like it's covered with eyes everywhere, and it covers itself with its wings. It's like this thing, and there are four of them around God's throne, and they're huge. They're scary, and there's, I mean, it's just, Ezekiel describes things, and you think, is this guy high on something? Because it doesn't sound like anything logical. It's like this being that is just illogical. It's crazy. It's immense, and Lucifer was one of God's cherubs. It's powerful. These are beings that you see them in the scripture. People see them, and they just fall apart. You can't even speak. Your tongue is stuck. Like, it has to touch you to give you strength so that you can speak back to it. That's that's scripture. You've read those scriptures, haven't you? And then what is God saying? He's saying, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know this is why the devil hates you? Because God, having made all the angels, then decided to make human beings and then decided they will have power over you. Actually, angels, you will be ministering spirits to them. And, and Lucifer was like, what the? Who, why? Why can't we be the ones in charge? And God says, no, 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 these ones are my sons. You guys are my servants, these ones are my sons. And then he goes ahead and makes them of clay. And then he breathes into them. And then he has a love relationship. Lucifer hates you. Because you have what he could never have. And he rebelled against God and he tries everything to fight you. And some of you, your families have been bound for decades by this, this 
this cherub who hates you with all his heart. But he is a good news, God's people. The Bible says, resist and he will flee. Resist and he will flee. There is no demon that is so powerful that it has power over you. As a child of God, greater is he who is in you than any spirit in the world. Yeah, you are guarded. And the one thing the devil wants to do, I talked about this the first day, the one thing he wants to do is make sure you don't know who you are. If he can keep you in ignorance, keep you passive, keep you not understanding, keep you a victim, then he's done his work. And all your life you'll just be praying prayers of, oh God, please, can't you see I'm suffering? Oh God, please, because you don't understand that prayer is not begging God. Prayer is inviting God into the situation because God has given you the authority to invite him. Oh my gosh. The God of heavens has decided I'm not working on earth except you invite me. That's why David says when he looks, he says, my goodness, when I consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're so mindful of him? Like David's like, what, how do you give us so much authority? David's mind was blowing up as he tried to understand, how do I have that much authority? Because he knew who he was. He knew who he was. So, so we must understand that God has given us authority. And he wants us to be aggressive with that authority. So God expects us to be aggressive in at least two areas. The first is in our love for God. God wants you to be aggressive in your love for him. Too many of us are passive in our love for God. Too many of us are, sh um, are, are too cool. We're divas in our prayers. We're divas in, in our faith. We're divas in, like in other things we're aggressive. When it comes to work, when our careers, when it comes to sports and our fans and all the things we love, we are foodies, we love food, we are passionate. But when it comes to prayer, we're just, hmm. it's like, we're just passive. We're passive. But God wants us to be aggressive in our love for him. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. It says, love the Lord your God with, come on somebody, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. He's like, not a bit of it. It's like he wants a hundred percent focus. Like, I don't love anything like I love God. Like, I'm passionate about God. I'm bursting with energy about him. I want people to know about him. I love this God. That's what he wants us to do. And by the way, God's people, when you see me in those Zoom calls saying, turn on your videos. Speak, turn, off your, turn on your mics. I want you to start modeling that to the church. Some of us, we don't know how to pray unashamed. And so I want you to start learning to model prayer because the church has to learn boldness. And they're not going to learn just by sitting there passively with their video off in bed with eyes closed. They don't even want to turn on the light. Like, <laughs> to re they read the verse like this and they close their eyes and pray like this. How, how will the devil ever be chased by Christians in their beds? Yeah. Guys, aggressive in my love for God. God. By the way, I was so excited to see people coming in at 5.30 and walking around aggressively, just praying in this place. By the way, the picture I had, and I got the same picture yesterday, was the saints are marching in. Like, I don't know why that, it was so, it was like, I sensed that even the angels are like, the saints are here. The saints are here. The saints are marching. The prayers are going up. There's something powerful our prayers do in the spiritual realm. The angels can't pray. It's us who pray. And when we pray, God's power is revealed. So the angels want us to pray. So I just sense a joy in the angelic realms. As people are walking in, one person, another person, two people, pastors comes with a whole gang from our house. The angels are like, the saints are here. The saints are here. Warfare can commence. Yes. God wants us to be passionate about our prayer. He wants us to understand we have authority over the area. And that's why I tell you, I started waking up at 4.30 because I said 5 o'clock the Muslims are up muddying the air. I want to be up 4.30 taking charge of the territory. I want to have passion for that because I understand God has given me authority to, to open and to shut. He's given me the authority. By the way, it's amazing. Those guys create altars. Like Jacob creates an altar. Abraham creates an altar. Do you know what an altar is? An altar is a portal to heaven. An altar is a place where angels descend and ascend. An altar is a place where the, it's like the, the, the film between earth and heaven is thin. And God has given human beings the ability to set up altars. We're the ones who create the portals. My goodness, my house is an altar to the Most High, by the way, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, there's a presence of God in my house. Angels ascend and descend in that place. And every morning I wake up to renew that altar. I wake up to just open up the heavens. 
I wake up to just say, Lord, this is your place. I surrender this house. I submit it to you. I, I, I wake up to say, Lord, my children cannot go, they cannot go wrong in this house. Father God, they will never depart from your word because when they're in this house, the Spirit of God is here. I wake up to pray for my house. I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about them loving God. I want them to love God. I want their love for God to be white hot. Passionate. And that's what God wants for every one of us. This passive thing of just being, being nice, nice Christians, let's put that behind us, guys. Tell your neighbor, diva no more. Yeah. Yeah, let's forget this divaness, guys. Let's forget the divaness. Yes, I know you didn't grow up in your church praying like that, but it's time for us to forget those things. Put them behind us and be passionate about God. Let's be passionate about Jesus. Don't be those, you know those husbands who the wife says, you've never told me you love, you, you love me. And the guy said, I told you six years ago and I married you. If I changed my mind, I'd have told you by now. Some of us are like that with Jesus, isn't it? It's like, but he knows my heart. Surely, why should I say it? Ah, which wife likes a husband like that? Nobody. Nobody. You've been troubled, by the way. You start saying that, you're one-way ticket to bachelorhood. <laughs> You're heading back where you came from. Yeah, none of us do that. And yet with God, we don't want to tell him how passionate we are about him, how we're excited about what he did for us yesterday, how excited we are to be part of his covenant. That's what God wants for us. And, and it's not just our words, by the way. It's our actions. First John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Our actions must show passion for God. Our truth must show action for What we were doing today as we went out to Great Wall, that's, that's passion for God. Amen. We're saying we're taking risks. We love God so much, we want to be in His will. We want to obey. It's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to do it in fear, but we'll do it anyway. That's, that's love for God. God wants us to be passionate in our love for Him. And He wants an aggressive love, a passionate... Aggr he wants us to delight in Him, to enjoy spending time with Him, to seek Him more than anything. This is what God wants for us. And listen, God said to us this year that this is the kind of love he's giving us for him. Every one of us, your love for God will be hot this year. This is what God desires. Aggressive, active love. Number two place that God wants us not to be passive but to be aggressive is against the enemy. Against the enemy. Our enemy. And we learn about this in, in Mizizi. It's the, it's the world, the flesh, the devil. And the devil is a, is a, he's the one who orchestrates all those but the flesh is those longings in us that are, against, that are opposed to God. The world is the system around us that seeks us, that causes us to do, uh, go against God's will. And then, of course, there's the enemy himself, the evil presence who orchestrates all those things. The, when it comes to the flesh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Like, this is not indifference. God wants you to put to death, like kill it, like work against it, destroy it, anything that is coming against you and your faith. God is saying, put it to death, put it aside, finish it, kill it. This is not like, oh, just excuse it. Oh, you know, that's how I am. I'm just not that kind of person. You know, I just, you know, understand me. It's just this thing, it's just I was born with it. Uh, 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 uh. Do what it takes. Kill it. If you need deliverance, look for deliverance. If you need prayer, look for prayer. Confess your sins to one another. Do what it takes for these things to stop being in your background. Like, finish it. In fact, you need to say it stops with me. Yeah. Let me tell you, the problem with sin and the flesh is that we pass it on. That's the biggest problem. And one of the reasons why I'm so scared of sin is because I carry sin in my life. I'm opening a door for my children to have the same sin. I'm bringing strongholds. So if I'm struggling with pornography and I have a secret habit of pornography, guess what I'm doing? Guess who I'm dooming? It's my son and his son. I'm opening a spiritual door. And this is not to scare you or to threaten you, but it's to say this is why you must be aggressive in dealing with that thing. Yeah. Get prayer. Get counseling. See a therapist. Do whatever it takes to just kill, kill, kill sin in your life. Now, it's interesting because Galatians 5.24, Paul talks a lot about killing, by the way. Eh? <laughs> Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Mm. Waking up at 4.30, you're crucifying. Crucifying. Some of you, it's been crucifying. Crucifying sleep. <laughs> it's dead already. <laughs> it's like some of you never thought you could wake up at 4.30. You're crucifying your sleep. Amen. What to, finished. Behind me. 
Why should, sin, why, why should sleep be the one that determines my relationship with God? No, my body cannot do that. I put it to death. Uh, actively conquering flesh. Now the devil, Ephesians 6 verse 11 to 13, uh, you know that, Ephesians 6. Put on the full arm of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And then he says, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then it says, therefore put on the spiritual armor of God, the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. You are a soldier, and soldiers fight. You know, that's the thing. Many Christians don't understand. You're actually a soldier. Uh, that's what it means to be a Christian. And soldiers fight. They resist. They wrestle. If you look at all the language there, they go against. They put on the armor. They arm themselves. They stand their ground. All these are just warlike terms. If you're passive when it comes to things of faith, then <laughs> I need to tell you, passivity is not an option for a Christian. It's not. You'll be overrun. You'll be finished before you left the barracks. Soldiers, by the way, Anybody who's ever, if you've ever played team sports, you know what I'm talking about. Like, people psych themselves, isn't it? It's like, you guys, we're going to win. Yes, we're going to win. We're going to kill these guys. Yes, we It's like, you have to do that. Because it's like, we don't want to walk into that field and then just be walked over. It's like, you have to bring all your aggression to the surface. Because that's the only way we'll avoid being finished by these people. Uh, I played rugby, and my goodness, it was wild. We just would whip ourselves to a frenzy by the time we get on that field. Because it's like, that, I need this energy because these guys are not going to watch. They're not going to watch while I score them. They are, they are organized against me doing anything against them. And listen, that's how the, when you wake up in the morning, the devil has planned his defense. He has his defense around your children to make sure you don't touch them. He has his defense around your business. He has his defense around your, his, he has his defense around you. So you have to wake up with aggression. Come on, somebody. This, this maneno of I can't put on, I can't put on my, I, I don't. Come on, guys. The devil is there. His video is on. Yeah. And he's not muted. He's speaking over you. Somebody has to be speaking in the airwaves and saying, not on my watch. Not on my watch. We have to have some aggression when it comes to the enemy, guys. Listen, you it is not an option for you. In, in fact, Jesus says, the marks of those who believe. <laughs> he says, Mark 16, verse 17. And these are the signs that will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Ask your neighbor, when is the last time you drove out a demon? Yeah. Yeah, when is the last time? Because Jesus says, this is a, this is a, this is a mark. <laughs> if you are to use this very seriously, it's a mark of those who believe. They drive out demons. When was the last time you drove out a demon? Because he says, this, I expect this of you. I expect this of my followers. You need to drive out some demons. Demons are not driven out by being passive. <laughs> they need some aggression. They need some passion. They need some energy. They need some, some knowing you're going to win. Paul says in Philippians uh, chapter 3, Another verse that Paul just shows you, Paul was a most militant guy. I love Paul. That's why I love Paul. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained all this or have taken or arri already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold for me. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to consider that myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead. He says, I press on. Somebody say, I press on. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's like, I mess up. I know that things didn't work out well yesterday, but I forget it in the morning. Forgetting what is behind, I press on. Tell your neighbor, press on. Press on. That's what my mornings are about, guys. That's what your mornings are going to be about the rest of this year. Press on. Press on. We're pressing on in prayer. We're pressing on in aggression. We're pressing on in evangelism. We press on. So what are the reasons? Why are people passive? Let me go real quick about reasons for passivity. Number one is neglect. As I've examined this subject, I realize that neglect is a major issue. People who did not feel loved, people who are neglected when they were growing up, they can grow up very passive. Children who are, who are like that grow up passive many times. Filled with self-pity, filled with no, self, no sense of agency. Agency means ability to the sense that I can do something about my situation. There's a sense of victimhood in them. And this comes from a low self-esteem. Many times what happens is that it makes you believe you're not worthy. It makes you believe that you really can't make a difference. We talked today and we said, if you feel like you're not worthy, you're a candidate for God to use. So absolutely, don't, don't let your feelings drag you back and tell you God can't use you. It doesn't matter what your background is. Paul says, forgetting what is behind, pressing on, pressing on to what, to what God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Number two, fear. Fear is another thing that makes people to be passive. Many people fear that they won't have the resources or the energy or the money to serve God. 
they hear, they're in a conversation like this, but the question in their mind is, how, what will this mean? How will this mean when I go forward? Will I be able to afford this? Will I have the time? Will I have the energy? Can I really manage this? What if God calls me to, to start doing crazy things in my job and I start looking weird? What if he even asks me to leave that job? Can I manage this? It's like, what if God asks me for too much? Maybe it's better for me not to over-engage so God doesn't notice me. Like, like, I don't want to be those guys. You know how those kids who are always at the, are in the front, so the teacher always asks them questions. Maybe it's better for me to sit in the back with my video turned off. Nobody will notice I'm there. So nobody asks me for too much. God doesn't ask me for too much. It's very easy. Fear can keep you passive in your faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. You know this first, guys. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, Self-discipline. That's a spirit. By the way, that's, that's you right now. Because you have the Holy Spirit. So right now you have the spirit in you of what? Power. Yeah. That's in you. So if you're not a person of power right now, it's not God's fault. It, it's because you have not understood the spirit that you have within you. You have the spirit of power. And you have the spirit of love, by the way. Love is what we talked about. You're a prayer provider. You're concerned about other people. You have the spirit of love. You can't help yourself. That's, that's a spirit in you. And you have the spirit of self-discipline as well. So God says, this is what I've called you to. Fear is not an option for you. Indiscipline is another one. Indiscipline causes people to be, man, so passive. A child who is brought up without discipline, and I, again, I'm talking about what I've seen, even in my practice. A child who's brought up without discipline will often grow up wild, like a weed, not aware of their capacity to be self-disciplined. If you bring up your children, and that's why I tell parents, parents, you're supposed to bring up your children in the way of the Lord and teach them discipline when you're young. Someone who doesn't discipline, his child hates them. That's what pro the, the proverb says. Uh, if you're just pampering them and you're not disciplining them, you're not teaching them God's ways, you're not training them in God's ways. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and at the end he will not depart from it. When he's old, he will not depart from it. That's what the Proverbs tell us. Proverbs 22, verse 15, tells us folly, folly is bound up. Foolishness is bound up. In the heart of a child, the rod of correction will drive it from him. When you're disciplining your child, the Bible, this is the Bible way. You know, it's very interesting. A friend of ours who used to teach the lair class, uh, we took a lair class with him. And there's a lady in his class who was in our class. And she was a psychologist, a PhD psychologist to even make things uh, better. And she had a child who was 16. She took this course because she said, I tried the way of psychology. I did all the things my psychological praxis taught me. Keep them on the corner. Make them understand time out. Have conversations. Reason with your child. She did this with that two-year-old until the child was 16. And then she realized, I'm raising a demon here. And so she left. She said psychology cannot help. She came to this church class. I don't even think she was a believer. She came to this. She wasn't a believer. She came to this church class and said, I am ready. Teach me. Because she said, my child has grown wild. They are not even able to manage themselves. Listen, God's word is powerful. When it says the rod of correction drives that foolishness out. Yeah, but you need to learn how to apply the road of correction. This is not beating we're talking about, it's training we're talking about. So, so some parents tend to be overprotective. They end up over, over bonding with their child. Your child is not your friend. That's Gilmore Girls. That's not how it's meant to be in real life. That is, that is not how God's intended. Your child, you should love your child. Yes, but you should understand there's a parent and there's a child. There's a distance and God created that distance. Stop trying to erase it. You're so overprotective, you can't even leave your child in the house. It's like your buddy. No. No, 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 that's not right. You need to start training them that they're going to leave the house one day. Yeah. When the Lord says you come for this event and you can't come because, oh, who's going to stay with little boy? Boy can handle life, by the way. And in fact, you need to start teaching him how to handle life now without mommy. Yeah. Go and serve God. Yeah, don't neglect boy. But when, you, when, when it's time to serve God, you serve God. Let somebody else look after boy. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't be, because what, what happens, you're teaching a child to just be indisciplined and to be dependent on somebody else to make decisions. And that's a passive child. That child will grow up passive. So don't excuse their bad behavior. These children will grow up expecting other people to take care of them and expecting other people to pray for them. They will have no sense of responsibility. And so make sure we don't do that. It's interesting. Those of you who played sports in school, I was privileged that I went to a school where we, that sports was a huge thing. Like it was a big deal. And what it did, I didn't realize until many years later, sports taught us how to crucify our flesh. It taught us that my body is not the boss of me. 
Yeah, I can, because I, in sports, it just forces you to do things that are uncomfortable. Whatever sport you played, I mean, if you play any sport, whether it's badminton, whether it's volleyball, whether it's rugby, sport teaches you to do things that your body is not comfortable doing. And then eventually they become comfortable because you teach your body. You know what? It's me who tells you what to do. You don't tell me. Yeah. And if you're not taught these things as a child, then you're going to have to train them into your life as an adult. It's a painful training. My wife can tell you because she didn't play sports growing up. So she, she, for her spiritual disciplines have been uphill. She's just had to take charge of her body and push. And by God's grace, she's been able to do it. I bless God for her. Yeah. I bless God for her. She's the one who taught me because she said, you know the reason you don't struggle? It's because you played sports. Yeah. yeah. Some, somehow you, man, you manage to learn. When they say you're fasting 21 days, you're like, Sawa, let's do it. If people have done it and not died, I can do it. <laughs> it's not because I'm strong, but it's because I was taught. I suffered and I, I didn't die. Yeah. It's important for you to know suffering won't kill you. Yeah, yeah it won't kill you. So, so this indiscipline causes some of us, and some of us, I hope you're identifying yourself right now. There are some of us that happened to us, and as a result, we've, learned, we've become very passive in our faith. I find it so hard to wake up. I find it so hard to be excited about the things of God. I find it so hard to go to... It's just I struggle with these things. I want you to understand the source of that, that passivity so you can deal with it. So you can deal with it. Number four, laziness. Laziness. Yeah. <laughs> can I turn on my mic? Am I off? Can you guys hear me? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Without a strong work ethic, a Christian will drift into passivity. If you're lazy, and laziness is actually a sin. The Bible talks about laziness as a sin. A work ethic is, most, is best developed before, during and before adolescence. So when you're young, that's when you're supposed to develop a work ethic. And basically, parents who don't require their children to work are dooming them to passivity. Yeah, if you're always looking after the maid is picking up their socks from the floor, somebody's picking their dishes from the table, poor John has to go and work, boy has to go and... Uh, what? He needs to be taught to work. Yeah, he needs to be taught to work. My wife was very amazing because growing up, she was, she, I mean, she came from a ninja mom. Her mom is an amazing mom. Uh, and so she learned to be an amazing mom. So very young, when our kids were very young, it's like as soon as they, they could walk with a plate stably, without falling, they could coordinate. It was their job to take their plate to the, to the kitchen. And then as soon as they could wash it, Actually, even before they could wash it, it was their job to wash it. They would stand on a stool and wash it really badly and then leave it there. And then the maid would come later and wash it. Or I would come later and wash it. But it's like, understand responsibility. As soon as they could, they started washing their clothes and their underwear and other things. And they started learning how to wash their school clothes while they're still in school. That boy who's being looked after by the washing machine, let me tell you something. He may not be able to afford that washing machine for himself. But you're teaching him never. It's, it's, it's so, let me tell you a true story. My son went to high school, to a boarding school. I think I told you a bit of the boarding school story earlier, did I? Okay, I won't go into detail. But he came back, and the reason we took him is because the guy was getting distracted. He was making too much money in high school. He was a baller. He, he's, he was very entrepreneurial. So we thought this guy needs to get in, uh, focused. And we took him to a boarding school. And he came like a shag's boarding school. Like, <laughs> like, like not a nice boarding school. He, he came back rich. And so we're like, dude, we took you to Shags. What, what is this about? He's a guy who's, he used to be the baller. Like he's a guy at the kiosk buying guys bread and buying guys whatever. So we took him from that nice school and took him to the Shags school so he can focus. In the Shags school, he was the dealer of them daos and the, what do they call gumu and all those things. So we ask him, KDF, yes. We ask him, so where are you getting this money? He told us, dad, you wouldn't believe it. None of these foolish kids know how to wash clothes. So all I did is I made a, a laundry list, and then I put prices, and so I washed trousers for this much, shirts for this much, socks for this much, and on weekends I wake up early, I wash all their clothes, and they pay me. And some of them even have a tub. <laughs> as soon as their parents pay them, they give them pocket money, they bring it to me. Like, I was rich, because he has a work ethic. So, so how do you teach your children to have a work ethic? Because you're saying, I, I want you to be delivered from passivity. I want you to understand that wherever you land, you have authority. And so some of us, because we're not brought up this way, we're passive. We're passive. And maybe we give all kinds of excuses. My family was poor. My parents just, no, 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 no. You're just lazy. And you need to just actually learn now to say, no, 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 I will be lazy no more. Tell your neighbor, lazy no more. Lazy. Yeah, lazy no more. Proverbs 26, verse 14. 26, 14. It says, as a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. 
425 alarm. T, T, snooze. <laughs> like a door. You know how doors turn? <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes later, T, T. Yeah, that's called laziness, guys. Um, King David sabotaged his destiny because of laziness. Did you know that? Yeah, 2 Samuel 11. It says, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war. This is when all kings went off to war. It says, David sent Job out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Like guys are fighting, guys are doing warfare, guys are conquering nations. But David is like, man, I just don't feel like going. Passivity. Passivity destroys faith. It destroys faith. Your, your discipleship group is going out to do evangelism and you're like, it's been real, guys. I'm coming. By the way, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Passivity destroys faith. It actually destroys faith. Um, beginning of the year, people have been fasting. Who fasts for you? Nobody fasts for you, by the way. It's like you have to do it for yourself, isn't it? And it's interesting because the first time we did a liquid fast, I thought I'd die. I actually thought I'd die. Um, so you too as well. How many people thought they'd die? Like, yeah, Pastor M, are you killing us? Like, what are you trying? Then we did it, and you're like, I lived. What? In fact, the first time I did it, I did soups in the evening. I was like, no, 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 this guy is not real. Like, I'll do soups. This year, I was like, what? I don't need soups. I didn't die. And I went to juices, and I was good. You know what? If you've been there before, you know you can't die, isn't it? And so, so guys, nobody's going to fast for you. Nobody's going to pray for you. Nobody's going to share the gospel for you. When you come to heaven, you won't be able to share my crown. You won't be able to say, Pastor M, can you share for me? You've got so many people. To <laughs> yeah, they're all, we're all Mavunites. Can we share? <laughs> no, you will have your own crown. And the people you brought, the people you shared the gospel with, the people who are in heaven because of you. So you must not be lazy. Uh, there were many mem lazy members in the church when Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 8, and he said, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied their faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, there are many people who are just passive. They are just there. They're like, let's just pray. God will provide for them. And Paul is like, no, no, no. You need to be aggressive. You need to be responsible. We need to quit excuses for not being fruitful and pray that God will help us live productive lives. No more excuses, guys. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm speaking for myself as well. No more excuses. Uh, guys, we're young. Let's serve God when we're young. And by the way, there's no old person in this church. Age is in your mind. It is you who is aging yourself. I know believers who are in their 80s who are passionate for Jesus. And doing great exploits for him. And it's easy for us in, in our 40s, in our 30s, in our 50s to start feeling, let the young people have a chance. Yeah. You know, I love the fact that King David, I mean, despite all the, neg the negative example I just used, that he, as king, danced so much that his wife was shocked. Like, you know how these young guys are dancing over here? And you could be like, hey, Mavuno, nowadays, how's young people? <laughs> <laughs> king David was in the middle of those young people dancing. For God, until his clothes were even falling off. He's like, oops. <laughs> like, like, he's the king, but in front of God, he's aggressive. He's passionate in his love. And my prayer is that none of us would ever grow old in our love for God. None of us would say, let's, let's leave the young people to do ministry. No, 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 no. I want to die. I want to preach, by the way, when I'm in my 90s. In fact, the best death I could die is I just preach and then I sit down and you guys are praying for me and then I don't wake up. Like I just went, shwa. Straight from the pulpit. Woo! <laughs> That'd be so awesome, man. Loving God until the last moment. Serving God until the last moment. No retirement in the Christian faith, guys. We have to be aggressive. Number five, sin. There's nothing that causes a Christian to be as passive as sin does. Sin is a horrible destroyer of passion. It kills your ability to worship God, your desire to worship God. When you break God's moral boundaries, you find that you don't have the willpower to obey him later. You find that you're, you, you always feel shame will keep you from worshiping. Shame will keep you from feeling, and defensiveness sometimes will keep you from wanting to come into God's presence. Every one of those commandments addresses the will. God's commandments address, you shall not, you will not steal. There's a will to it. We have to choose not to disobey God. And when we disobey, guess what happens? <laughs> we get trapped by our appetites. We get tra trapped by our appetites. When we sin, Guess what happens? Our appetites begin to master us. And you soon find somebody saying, I can't break out of this thing. It's become a habit. 
I can't stop drinking. I can't stop smoking. I can't stop sleeping around. I can't stop uh, pornography. What's happening is these things are just, the spiral of passivity is beginning. And these things are pulling me farther and farther and farther away from my passion from God. Somebody has to stop and say, not on my watch. I'm going to do what it takes to break out of this thing. I'm going to get the help it takes. And the devil keeps whispering in your ear and telling you, don't tell anyone. What will they think about you if they know you're stuck here? It's time for someone to say in this house, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. I'm not going to allow you to sabotage my destiny. There is no shame in coming clean. The Bible says, when I was silent, my bones wasted away. When, and then I confessed my sins to the Lord, and the Lord restored me. That's what Psalm, David says in Psalm 32, that we must, when we confess, that God restores us. And it's time for you to understand that keeping that secret, you know, I, uh, this is something we are taught as very young Christians. The devil will always try to substitute your thoughts. He can't hear your thoughts, so he tries to substitute your thoughts. So what he does is he whispers things, but he whispers them in first person. So he tells you, wow, this thing is hard, Pastor M is saying. I don't feel it. He's not saying, I, the devil. He's like, I, Osai, don't feel it. So you think it's yourself talking. He puts thoughts that substitute your thought, so you think it's you talking. It's called inception. He incepts a thought in your mind. Yeah. First person singular. <laughs> I can't do this. And so it's like, I, Pastor Ian, what he's saying right now is so hard. This is so unrealistic. Surely, does he even know what, where I am? This thing, don't even tell him. You learn to take, the Bible says, we take every thought captive and we make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Even my thoughts. When I hear a thought like that, I say, that thought is opposed to Jesus. I say, by the way, I speak, you can think I'm crazy sometimes. I take thoughts captive loudly. I say, thought, I take you captive right now and I make it obedient. Let me just tell you guys. Let me give a, 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 a real hint here. Those of you who struggle, even say it's masturbation, pornography, it's, it's, it's sex. When you're in the middle of the temptation, just say these words to yourself. I take that thought captive right now and I make you obedient to Jesus Christ. Boom. Try it. This thing is actually a spiritual thing. You will actually find those feelings have gone. I know there are counselors and psychologists here who will look at me very suspiciously. <laughs> what manner of doctrine am I teaching you? I have tried it. When you're in the middle of a temptation, speak to that thought. And then you're going to start understanding, oh my God, that was not even my thought. The thought departs and you're like, what? That is so deceptive. It was the devil. And here I was thinking it was me who was tempted. Just say, I take you captive and I make you obedient to Jesus Christ. Speak to yourself. Speak to the thought. You'll be shocked. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 says, be violent in how you deal with, with sin. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. I mean, that's, that's, that is aggressive, isn't it? He says, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. So don't blame it. Don't blame it on, this is how I was made. It's my personality. I'm just a flag. I'm just relaxed. No, 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 no. All personality types struggle with, all personality types struggle with passivity. All of us struggle. Flags can seem more, more, more passive because they're fearful. But let me tell you something. Uh, sanguines can be passive because of our commitment. So the way sanguines become passive is they just say yes and yes and yes to everything until they can't say, no. they can't say, they can't say yes to what God is asking them to do. And that's a way of being passive. And some of you are sanguines, you know that. Uh, males can be passive because of overanalysis. Those of you who are melancholies, you will you'll take this thing home and you'll analyze and analyze until the opportunity has gone. That's what males do. I can hear some nervous laughter in the house. Uh, cholerics can be passive because of selfishness. They're thinking, how does this work for me? They, 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 they think about themselves first. All of us are sinful, regardless of your personality types. This, this thing of passivity is true for all of us. It's just that it plays out differently. So let me just say why, I'm trying to run with my notes here, why you can't be complacent, why you can't afford to be complacent in 2022. This is not your option. It's not an option for you. Number one, you grow or you die. You grow or you die. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 says, uh, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You, you need milk, not solid food. You know, somebody said we're growing, either we're growing in spiritual maturity or we're backsliding. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral gear in Christian life. It's either forward or reverse. There's no, I'm just hanging right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a strange thing. And this thing about, it's, it's just such an interesting thing that many times what we feel is like, I'm, I just feel like I just need to take a break. I just need to take a sabbatical from being a Christian right now. Guess what happens? The treadmill is just moving you backwards. Have you ever tried, have you ever tried standing still on a treadmill? Not a treadmill. Uh, what is this thing called? Uh, an elevator, uh, escalator. 
if you're, if you're on an escalator and maybe you're going the wrong way and then you stop, you'll just keep going back. If you're on a treadmill and you're walking and then you just say, hey, this is much work, let me just pause. It'll just take you back. So in this Christian life, either you're walking or you're walking back. There is no middle ground. And this is what, this, this is what we must be aggressive in this way. You're growing or you're dying. You're growing or you're dying. Assess your Christian life. Are you still doing the things that you did two years ago? Are you still praying the same way that you prayed two years ago? Are you still serving the same way you served two years ago? Are you still giving the same way you gave two years ago? Then you're dying. Seriously, if your prayer is the same as it was two years ago, you're dying. You're actually dying. You're not growing. Because it's glory to glory. It's forward movement. So I need to be able to say, my giving now is not what it was two years ago. There's growth. My prayer is not, and thank God for all of us now we can say, my prayer is not what it was two years ago. Even six months ago. Praise God. Yes. There's growth in the church. <laughs> but listen, next, when we meet again for our next gathering, your, your, your prayer can't be where it is now. Yeah. You have, to be, you have to have moved forward, isn't it? Yeah, there's an aggression that is called for. You have to be, like, I'm, I really want to grow in my prayer. I told you guys about Reverend uh, Adeboye uh, of RCCG, and the guy prays five hours every day. Hey, I have my model. My, my, my standards are set for me. The people ahead of me are doing it. And I'm already looking. Okay, right now, how many hours? Hey, okay, there's work to be done. But I'm getting there. I have a target. I'm pressing on. I'm not content to be praying the hours I'm praying right now. Right now, I'm probably doing about two hours. And I thank God for that. Because last year, uh, this time, I was not even doing that 20 minutes. Eish, okay, I know. Pastor M, seriously, that's a big confession. Yes, it's true. I wasn't. I was doing maybe 40 minutes of reading the word and I'd pray for 20 minutes if I'm lucky. Now I'm praying for two hours. Praise God. And I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. We've been coming with Pastor James, the pastor of this church. He loves prayer. He's an amazing man. So he's, he's, we've been staying with him. So he's like, five, he's, been waking, he's been getting us up early. So he, Pastor Trevor and I have no choice. We're here at five in the morning. As you guys are coming in at six, we've been praying for an hour. And it's lovely. It's not even, like now I'm enjoying it. And I'm already looking and thinking, okay, Reverend Adebwe, I'm coming. Yeah, yeah, five hours, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. I, 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 by faith, we're going to get there. Hey, listen, God is going to give you more and more spiritual children. You can't pray the same prayers you're praying now. Because you have to expand your prayer life to accommodate the people God is bringing to your life. Right now, if you've been praying an hour for yourself and God is giving you a discipleship group to disciple, those are six other souls to pray for. Where are you going to squeeze them? You can't squeeze them in. You still need to pray for yourself. So you need to make a little extra time so that you can pray for your DG as well as yourself. Amen? Amen. And by the time you're like, <laughs> let me just tell you, you will grow. You know, it's in, when, when you say you will, you will, you, God will give you nations, now people are not saying amen because they know what that means. <laughs> because it means you will have to pray prayers for nations, isn't it? If I'd not said about prayer and I just said God will give you nations, the whole church would have said amen. <laughs> but now that I've said God will give you nations after prayer, it's like, hey, what? two people say amen. God will give you nations. Amen. Yes! Yes. So you have to grow. You grow or you die. Number two, your time is running out. Your time is running out. <laughs> I was checking to see my time is running out. You have one life. God put you on earth to represent him. It's a mistake to think this opportunity will always be there. It won't. Second, uh, Second Corinthians 5.20 says we are Christ's ambassadors as though God was making an appeal through us. Yes. God has put us here to make an appeal to, to people. Luke chapter 16, you remember the story where the rich man asks, I beg you, send Lazarus. He's like, yeah, send Lazarus to talk to my brothers because these guys don't know you. Send Lazarus. It's the, I don't want my brothers to come to this place of torment. That's what this guy was saying because he understood, my goodness, I thought I had time, I didn't have time. A time will come when you'll not be able to preach the gospel. We talked about that. Jesus said, night is coming. And the best time to sow is when you're still young. This is the best time for us to bring people to Jesus. It, the, uh, the best time to bring to, to serve God is when you're young. The second best time is now. Yeah, now, if you, don't worry. If you didn't serve God when you're young, there's still a chance. Number three, God will use someone else. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't uh, serve, God will use someone else. And it's interesting because this passage, I really believe God showed it to me when I was a very young Christian, and I'd never, it, it, it just came to me and I was in shock when I read it the first, I mean, when I, when, I, when, I, when I clicked it. Because 
There's a, there's a passage in uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, the end of Genesis 11. I always knew about Abraham. But this passage, it's like God just revealed it once when I was reading the word, and I was like, oh my goodness. Terah took his son Abraham, that was Abraham's daddy, and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abraham. And together they set out from Ar of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So, so remember who was called to go to Canaan? It wasn't Abraham, it was Terah. The call was actually Abraham's daddies. But this guy got to a place called Haran. And if you've read the story before that in Genesis 11, he had a son called Haran who had died. He got to a place of grief, and his grief kept him from following, pursuing Jesus, pursuing God's call. And he got to Haran, and the Bible says he settled there. And then the Bible tells us he lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Some of us, by the way, we are dying in the place we're in right now. It's like you've reached a place of stagnation in your faith, and you will die because you're not moving forward. God will find somebody else. He will. Because the purpose of God must be fulfilled. And unfortunately for Terah, it was even his own son who became the father of faith. We'd all be saying Father Terah. Now we say Father Abraham. I mean, it's so sad. Father, Father Terah, the terrorist. <laughs> no, <laughs> Pastor Kilonzi, seriously. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it would be Father Terah. But now it's Father Abraham. Because Abraham went when God called him. So, so... The kingdom of heaven is bursting forth. We've talked about it. It's, move, it's being taken by violent men. People are advanced. It's passionate people have taken hold of its power. That's what the Bible tells us. We need to be those passionate people who are taking hold of God's power. The kingdom will advance with or without me. Yeah. It will. But oh my goodness, why would I want to waste my opportunity to be in the center of what God is doing? Why would I want to waste my opportunity to be in the biggest thing that is happening in the universe and has ever happened? This is my opportunity. So three, things to three ways to, define, to defeat passivity, and then I'll be finished. Three ways you can defeat passivity in your life. And these are going to be things that you're going to find important this year. Number one, die to self. Die to self. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. It says, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Yeah? And it says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Guys, this is Christianity. Yep. This is what it means to follow Jesus, to be saved. This is not extra for pastors. Everything you have belongs to God. God is not saying necessarily like he said to the rich young ruler, give me all your money and become poor. That's not necessarily what he's saying to us. He deals with every one of us differently. Because he didn't tell the disciples to give up their money and become poor. But this young man, he told him because money was his God. So we're, God will deal with us differently. But whether he asks you to give it up and serve somewhere else, or whether he keeps you in the same job, listen, when you follow up Jesus, you give up everything. That's what it means. If you haven't given up everything to the master and said it's yours, use it as you choose, then you're not really a Christian. That's what the scripture teaches. It's just the hard truth. Jesus was not even polite about it. He just says, you cannot be my disciple. <laughs> Either you're fully surrendered to Jesus, or you're not his disciple. That's how simple it is. And that's why he, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. You guys remember this one. And I no longer live, but who lives? Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. That's the most elemental memory verse we learned in Mizizi, that we must crucify our flesh, that we give up everything to Jesus, that my house is his to use, my car is his to use. The more he promotes me, the more I have for the kingdom. That's what he wants from every one of us. And it's not a scary thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a privilege to serve his, that passion. So, so let me just encourage us. Number one, die, die to self. Just surrender everything you have. It's not a, it's not a scary thing to surrender because it was never yours in the first place. Yes. Yeah. So just give it up. Say, God, this is your house. Show me who you want me to invite after church. <laughs> Show me which discipleship group you want me to host here. Show me why you gave me such a big house. And some of you should even be saying, God, give me a big house so I can host a discipleship group. Yeah, yeah. Pray for God to bless you so you can bless others. Lord, give me a car so I can give people rides to church. Yeah, pray for those things to be ble a blessing to others. Number two, set spiritual goals. Set spiritual goals. Somebody say, I will not be a passive Christian. Yeah, yeah. Set, set spiritual goals. You know, you have to foster a desire to grow. You have to choose to want to grow. You know, when I was a young leader, I used to pray every day that God would, especially when I became a young pastor, I used to pray every day that God would give me spiritual authority. 
I was so intimidated by being in front of people. I was so intimidated by being in front of the church. I was so intimidated by just being called anything near pastor that I just used to pray, Lord, give me, I, like I knew all the verses about spiritual authority in the Bible. I used to just pray for myself. I used to, to be so scared that I'd just be like, God, give me authority like you gave Joshua. Joshua was so distinguished that Israel recognized he was their leader. God distinguished him so that he could give him credibility. I'd be like, God, I claim this blessing. I would look for Christian leaders with authority and I'm like, Lord, I tap into that blessing. That's what I desire. I knew I needed it. As a Christian leader, I knew I had to grow. I had to desire, I had to set goals for myself. So, uh, uh, it's interesting, David set us a goal for himself in Psalm 27 verse 4. He says, one thing I've asked for the Lord. That's his goal. It's like, here's the thing I want. God, every morning I pray this thing. One thing I ask of the Lord. This is what I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. That sounds like somebody saying, Lord, wake me up to pray at 4.30. Lord, I want to be in your presence the whole day. Lord, I want to understand how to seek you. Give me passion. You know, by the time he's praying that, it means he doesn't have it. He wouldn't be asking for it if he had it, isn't it? So David has learned to ask God for more of him. He's learned to be passionate to ask God. And guess what happens in his life? He ends up becoming called the man after God's heart. You, nobody's born a man or a woman after God's heart. It's your passion for him that will make you that person. So Paul's goal, also Paul had a goal, by the way. Philippians 3.10. I want to show you that great men and women of God had goals, a goal, a spiritual goal. Philippians 3.10. I want to know Christ. Yes, and the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul's like, I want to know God. I want to be like him. I even want to die like Christ. Christ died, and that's why he resurrected. Because he gave his whole life to God, God resurrected him. Lord, I want to be like Christ. I want to die for you in everything I do. And because of that, I want to be resurrected in you. Paul, and he lived for that. He's like, I'm going, that's my passion, my life passion. Let me ask you, what are you praying for right now in your life? You know, some of us are praying for a new car. We're praying for a promotion. And these things are great. We come for 4.30. And in fact, that's the thing that wakes me up. I need a promotion at work. And you're praying for those things. They're great. But what are you willing to do to grow in your spiritual life? Because this car will go, by the way. That promotion will pass on. But there's eternity that you need to be setting goals for. Paul says again, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. He says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? And then he says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Come on, somebody. Run to get the prize. There are many people who are running. But some people will get the prize. There are many people who want the prize, but they're not willing to train for the prize. And so let's run to get the prize. This year, there's a prize in this house. Yeah. This year, God is going to appear to people in their dreams. Yeah. By the way, people are going to have visions in this church. Open visions, not even asleep. You will actually see people sharing in your churches about visions that they had. And it, you're going to be in awe. There will be actual miracles that will be documented. Medical miracles in this church, by the way, this year. They will be. Amen. But let me say this, guys. We have to want it. We have to want it. You have to desire it. We have to seek first God's kingdom. We have to set spiritual goals for ourselves. God will help you grow, but you have to want to grow. Like I said, John was the disciple Jesus loved, but John was always next to Jesus' bosom. He was there. He hung on to Jesus. This year, I'm hanging on to Jesus, guys. Yeah. I'm going to hang on. I'm praying like I've never prayed before. I'm seeking God like I've never sought God before. I want him for myself. I'm looking, I'm, I'm reading stuff. I'm listening like, I, like I'm hungry for him this year. And I'm praying that that will be true of all of us. That's our portion. Amen. Amen. Number three, the last one. Do the word. Do the word. Um, do the word. James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. By the way, let me tell you guys, this is going to be such a powerful principle. Even in this passage, one of the reasons I want you to write your testimony is because you need to understand what God has taught you in this place. Because you, he's given you, I've, I've, this has been a fire horse, hasn't it? It's like, it's in, like you've gotten so much stuff. You're not going to be able to do everything that I've taught you this week. And I get it. But what is that one thing you're moving away with that is your revelation that you're going to practice? That you're going to do what the word told you? Let me tell you something. I said this before. God's word to you, God's revelation to you, is only as good as your last obedience. Yeah. If, 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 you, if you obey and you take a word here and you run with it, guess what will happen? The next time you come, you will hear it even clearer. 
Because God speaks to people who listen. Have you ever been in a conversation, you're talking to somebody, and then as they're talking to you, they're looking at something, they're looking at their phone. They're, what happens? They're distracted. At some point, you, you just stop talking. It's like, I don't want to talk to this person. Clearly, they're not listening to me. So if you do what God says, he will speak again. And next time, he'll even speak louder. So he says, listen, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror. He looks at the face in the mirror. He says, I look so nice. And then he turns away and he forgets how he looks like. It's like he's trying to put, it's like someone's trying to put on makeup without, like, I look at the mirror, and then I take the lipstick and I put on. You forgot, like, you have to keep looking at the mirror. You can't just look and gaze away. You have to, doing is what's going to help you change. You have to intently keep looking. It says, whoever looks, 25, whoever looks intently into the perfect law of God. Come on, uh, verse 25. It says, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting that they, what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Hey, 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 you keep looking. You keep holding on. What is that word I'm holding on from this word, from these four days? What am I taking home with me? What will I keep doing this year? I'll remind myself. I'll keep gazing. Guess what's going to happen? Boom. The transformation I'm praying for will happen. There are many reasons why people don't do what the word says. There are many people, people think maybe it'll work, maybe it's working for others, it's not working for me. Maybe I'm a victim of my past. I was brought up, brought up in a dysfunctional family. This is just the way I am. I, you soon hear people saying, I tried Christianity, it didn't work for me. But many times what happened is that person did not do the word. You know, it's like you heard it, it's like, but you didn't do it. And I can promise you, if you just become a, this, every, every time you hear a message, every time at family, and I just ask yourself, what's one thing I need to do? You find your faith becoming passionate. You heard the story of Pastor Victor and Zeddy and how they had one thing at the last gathering and they had free the future. And they went immediately and they gave a gift to that. And boom, transformation. The things that we said would happen to everybody by the end of the year, they already have it now. Like it's acceleration. So, so it's like, what are you going to do that will accelerate you? Do what it says. Do what it says. Um, I said the last thing, but I'm going to throw one bonus. Can I throw you one bonus one? Yeah. Know whose you are. Know whose you are. Yeah. You know, many people are struggling with feelings of unworthiness. I say that, and that is leading them to be passive. I'm not as gifted as so-and-so. Even now, after we prayed, there's still somebody who's struggling with that. This one was an extra one that God gave me. I'm not as gifted as so-and-so. I'm not qualified to teach others. I still have issues in my own life. Somebody's struggling with those thoughts. Ah, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. Just put it up if you have it. Oh, there you go. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Just put the, put the one before there. I just want you to stay on the screen for a little bit. It is, let's just read it together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Come on, I'm speaking right now. You have the gift of God in your life. Yeah. Your salvation does not depend on your competence. God is giving you his gift. Those gifts that you're going to see coming out of your life will not come because you're such a holy person. In fact, some of you who are going to pray prayers, you're going to be shocked because you're going to be doing miracles that holy people are not doing. And you'll be wondering, why is it that I'm doing this, mess, this thing and people who've been saved for 20 years are not doing these things? It's not because of your holiness. It is a gift of God. Receive the gift of God, somebody. Because God is in this house. Listen, we're not competent. None of us is competent. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. It says, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. So I want us to just, right now, understand, passivity is not an option. Tell your neighbor, passivity is not an option. In fact, I want us to just stand to our feet right now as we receive this message, as we own this message, as we take this message and make it our own. Passivity is not my option. This year, I'm not living a passive life. This year, I'm living an aggressive life. This year, the gates of hell are not prevailing against me as a daughter of the Most High King. This year, my job description reads, Servant of the Lord. I'm no longer just a banker. I'm no longer just a, a student. I'm no longer just a housewife. I am a servant of the Most High God. The Spirit of God lives in me. And because of that, I will do exploits. Nothing can hold me back this year. There's nothing the devil can say that can hold me back. Somebody in the house hearing me right now. I'm giving you the pronouncements. Begin to make them for yourself right now. 
Let's begin to proclaim this word. Come on, speak it aggressively. There's no passivity in the house. Yeah. Remember, we've said you own it. You own it. I will not be passive. I will not be that person who sits back when people are taking the kingdom. As people are celebrating people coming to Jesus, I will not be that person who's just sitting in church clapping my hands. I want my own people. I will serve God. My house will be a house of prayer. My house will be God's possession. My car will be used to glorify God. My possessions will be His. I will see the advancement of God's kingdom in my time. I will be used by God. I will not wake up. I will not sleep when people are praying. I will wake up to pray. My disciples will not out. Pray me. My disciples will not wake up before me. I will be up ahead of them praying for them. I will model to my children what it means to have a prayer life. Oh. Begin to call it out. Begin to say, Lord, I, I claim this my blessing. I claim my blessing in Christ Jesus. Lord, I will be aggressive. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Biazo, that's my portion in Christ Jesus. I will be violent and I will take it by force. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Father, thank you for every prayer that is going up. Doers of the word, not hearers of this word. I bless you for them. People who will serve God while they're still young. That's who we have in this house. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Hey, listen, you are the seed. All of you who are watching online and all of you who are in this room, you are the seed. This church is a big church, much bigger than the people who are gathered here in this room today. But God didn't call all those people to be in the house. He called you as the seed. You didn't choose yourself to be here, by the way. God selected you to be one of those who would receive it first. And through you, many will be blessed. You are the seed. You are the ones God is sending out. Not everybody in your campus was able to be here today. But God doesn't need everyone to start a revival in your campus. You are the seed. You are the ones he's going to use. He didn't bring everybody in the discipleship group system here. He only brought the few of you from your campus. But that, the ones God brought are the only ones he needs. Because you are the seed. You are the seed. Through you, the revolution is going to start. Listen, don't make this revolution go at your speed. Let it go at God's speed. Because the revolution will go faster than you can actually accept. It will go faster than you even imagine. You are the seed that God will use. Let me just say that right now, God is giving birth to ministries in this house. Hey, right now, we're going to commission some people who are going to plant churches in this house. We're going to commission people who are going to start ministries in this house. Already, God is dropping divine ideas in people's minds in this house. Right now, He's doing it. He's doing it. And we'll hear testimony today of those. We're going to commission those people. And I just want to speak over you a spirit of boldness. I know I've spoken this before, but I'm just going to emphasize it. Listen, the word God gave us at the beginning of this church was fearless. He gave us the word fearless. And fearless is not the absence of fear. It is doing it anyway. And so I speak over you a spirit of boldness right now. Yeah, I speak over you impartation of boldness. You will be unashamed, shamelessly unashamed. You will be those people who are bold and violent for the kingdom of God. Hey, come on, I speak over you. Receive it right now. This is your portion in Christ Jesus. No more messing around. No more messing around with the demons that are terrorizing the people around you. You're going to, be, you're, you're going to have holy anger. God will lead you to places of holy anger where you say, I cannot see people being terrorized on my watch. Yeah, he'll wake you up to pray for people. He'll give you such compassion for the people around you who are dying. You no longer listen to that woman who cries every night when her husband is abusing her and you just listen. You will actually be aggressively praying. You'll be up at two o'clock praying for your neighborhood. This is you. And so Father God, I just release this impartation upon your people now. I release this impartation of boldness. And I pray that Lord, even after this, as we take a few minutes to commission your people, Lord, we're inviting your Holy Spirit to just show off. Show off, Lord. Come Holy Spirit. Father God, the Spirit today that you're, is going to rest upon your children, it's not for them, it is for the world. And Lord, I pray that because of them, every campus in Mavuno Church will be white hot on fire for you. Father God, there will be miracles in every campus in Mavuno Church. Come on, lift those hands right now. Father, I speak over these hands, that Lord, miracles, signs and wonders will be done by those hands. The laying on of those hands will be powerful and effective. That Father God, we will pray and things will change because we prayed them. And so I pray for a boldness to pray for people, a boldness to take it by force. No more passivity in our lives, Christ Jesus. We invite you now to just come and resident, dwell, resident in our lives through your Holy Spirit. 
And so I bless you, God's people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, somebody give glory to God.